Our next speaker is Rebecca Hain, and she's with USGS at the Lake Ontario Biological Station. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, for those of you who saw Brian Whittle's talk at the LOTC meeting on Tuesday or Doug Carlson's presentation earlier today, um, you're going to see some of the same figures and the same data. So you can tell we're uh, moving on sharing figures and data out of here. They're not speaking out. Um, so I'm talking about the benthic cruise, so I figured I'd start out with some of the benthic prey fishes that we were targeting. Um, so we've got our native fishes, uh, such as the slimy sculpin and deep water sculpin, and our invasive that everyone is coming to know and love, the round goby. Um, so here's a quick overview of the basic bathymetry of Lake Ontario. Approximately 80% of the lake is deeper than 100 meters, with an average depth of 86 meters and a maximum depth of 245 meters. These numbers are greater than those of neighboring Lake Erie and Lake Huron, although the surface area of Ontario makes it the smallest of all the Great Lakes. Uh, Lake Ontario is divided into four primary basins. From west to east, these are the Niagara, right here, uh, the Mississauga is the biggest, Rochester is the deepest, and the eastern basin out here is the shallowest. Um, the introduction of more native, of more invasive species and the reemergence of previously thought extant native, native species has posed questions in a Napoleonic context. So the difference between the historic survey and the new survey is that the new survey is set up to collect data from all the lake habitats in depths ranging from 6 meters to 225 meters. And to expand understanding of the areas in the depths where invasive species such as round goby have settled and those preferred by native species such as the deepwater sculpin. Other physical data, including temperature, clarity, and available nutrients, will add to the bigger picture of how Lake Ontario is changing over time. This figure depicts the proportion of lake area by depth and the corresponding proportion of all historical trawling sites. Uh, the shallower depths, as you can see in uh, the gray and the black, uh, were sampled at a much higher rate than accurately represented the system, while depths greater than 150 meters were not able to be sampled um, at the time, the capability to sample these depths was simply not available. The new survey is designed to more accurately reflect the depth portions of Lake Ontario, and as you can see, the deeper depths are now able to be incorporated into the design thanks to new, more advanced trawling gear. Uh, looking in a spatial sense, the survey as it existed prior to 2015 was limited to six transects, two on the south shore of the Mississauga, and four in the Rochester Basin. Um, so we had a total of 55 historical trawling sites. In uh, 2015, we expanded the survey, as you can see here in red, to 19 transects, so we totaled 135 trawl sites. So we um, really tried to expand that survey to more adequately sample the available lake habitats. The undertaking was made possible through collaborative efforts between the New York DEC, um, we sampled uh, primarily in the Eastern Basin over over here in uh, purple, um, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in the light blue, and USGS, which culminated in the first lakewide survey since 1972. Uh, in previous studies, the southern shore of Lake Ontario has been found to be more highly populated with dry seated mussels. So I just started about five months ago, and I hadn't any experience IDing fish in freshwater systems in the north. So the joke was, you know, they asked me, can I separate silverfish from ground fish from dry seeded mussels? I'm like, okay, great, this sounds wonderful. I can get this no problem. So as you can see from these photos, uh, lots and lots of dry seeded, few silverfish, ground fish thrown in there. Life's pretty good. Well, then we went out into the west. So here, this is a site in Hamilton, which is our furthest western point, and this is 15 meters. We had the normal catch of alewife, rainbow smell, brown goby. Um, this catch, although it's not represented in this photo, did have some dry seeded mussels in it as well. And a whole bunch more species that I, I had no idea what they were. Uh, so uh, we got more um, gizzard shad, emerald shiner, spot tailed shiner, yellow perch, white perch, lake white fish, brown white fish. So uh, my little learning curve was suddenly unexpected and uh, very steep. Um, again, in the West, specifically Toronto this time, we untangled an assortment of fish, including three spine sticklebacks from masses of macrophytes. And in the catch, we saw more lake white fish and more round white fish. So this had me thinking, do species richness and diversity differ in distinct geographical areas of the lake? So first we looked 
looked at the diversity of the new sites using the Shannon Index and compared that to the historical sites. You can see quite a difference in there. These uh, new sites definitely had much higher uh, species diversity. So using the new data, the whole lake diversity was recalculated and we ended up with a much higher average at um, 1.37 from our historical plot of 0.97. Further spatial breakdown of the species richness into basins, we see that species richness is greatest in the eastern basin, followed by the Niagara. So we've got uh, greater species richness on the furthest west basin and in the furthest east basin. Um, all these transects are part of our new sampling design. So the Rochester Basin, which is the third from the left, uh, is slightly less, and the Mississauga, of course, as you can see quite clearly, has the least amount of species richness. All right. So there's species richness. Let's go back to species diversity. Um, this is where things get interesting. The Niagara and the Eastern Basins have the highest species diversity but have very different bathymetric profiles. The Eastern Basin is primarily shallow, as denoted by you know, the red orange coloring up here in the right. And over here in the Niagara Basin, the depth profile is deeper. So, as I said earlier, the Rochester Basin has the deepest, uh, is the deepest basin out of these four, but it has lower species diversity although not as low as the Mississauga here, with the 1.08 being our lowest species diversity. So there's no obvious trends uh, related to depth. So then we thought, let's look at temperature. So checking out the average temperature gradient, we see that the Niagara Basin has a north to south uh, increasing temperature gradient over the smallest area, and that the Eastern Basin has by far the highest average temperature. Uh, the Rochester and the Mississauga have relatively concentric uh, temperature gradients. Again, no obvious trends stand out. So, you know, I just started kind of looking at our data. And uh, so what did we see at these new transects and sites that made such a difference in species diversity? So these are the top 10 of the largest differences in number of individuals per species caught. The historic sites are on the left, and the, uh, our new sites are on the right. So all but one of these species show a higher number of individuals caught at the new sites. Our oddball in this top 10 list is alewife right here at the top, where we caught almost six times less alewife at the new transects as we did uh, in the historic sites of transects, which brings us to the main question of why. So the western and eastern basins have shallower average depth, but the Rochester Basin, again, is the deepest and has a higher diversity in species richness than the shallower Mississauga. The temperature map indicated that the Niagara Basin has a much greater range of temperature than the eastern basin, but species diversity were the same. So other future directions that we might look at, um, focus on availability of nutrients, uh, water clarity, the idea that higher areas of embayments in the Niagara and eastern basins may contain more diverse habitat, or the idea that inlets on the west and outlets in the east make for excellent species corridors which increase diversity and species richness in these eastern and western basins. All right, so looking at single species implications, we're back to our round goby and our slimy sculpin and deep water sculpins. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> so the densities of round goby at the historic site versus the new sites show relatively little change with a very slight increase in density, as you can see at this uh, one site up here. Um, but these new sites that showed higher density, they weren't quite enough to affect um, the general trend. Similarly, with the slimy sculpin, we see again just a slight increase in density in these uh, new sites as opposed to the historic sites. <coughs> but again, not enough to impact really the general trend. Uh, deep water sculpin's density was most impacted by these new sites. The density increased by an entire order of magnitude, which begs the question, is deep water sculpin population recovering, or did the expansion of the survey allow us to better target the deep water sculpin habitat? I'm not answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so to better understand the habitat occupied by deep water sculpin, we looked at presence absence data. This uh, dotted line right here represents the 100 meter bathymetric contour line. So deep water sculpin were caught on both sides of the 100 meter line at all of the deepest trail sites. I just want to point out up here in the eastern basin, they were caught as well, even though the eastern basin is by far, you know, has all that shallow area. Uh, refining this data a little bit, the highest densities were found towards the deepest part of the basin with the exception of that one eastern site in the upper right hand corner. Um, and so 
In the, at the end of the day, we added new detail sites in our historic transects and 13 entirely new transects for a total of 70 new trawl sites. All for what? <laughs> we found species diversity is higher than we thought it could be for the entire lake, with the highest diversity in the Niagara and Eastern Basins. Um, this can be useful when looking at other lower extreme Great Lakes systems for trends and possibly predicting how Ontario will continue to change. Uh, the invasive brown goby has settled into its niche and seems to occupy the same habitat at consistent densities throughout the entire lake. Uh, slimy sculpins as well, uh, their densities and biomass are consistent uh, lake-wide. Deepwater sculpin were a surprise in our extended survey. Uh, they are more numerous and exhibit higher density and biomass at the new deep, deep sites at the historic transects and in the new transects as well. So, and now we can track changes on physical in physical gradients on a more comprehensive level. This lake-wide study will allow trends and changes to be observed on a much finer scale. I want to thank our partners at the New York DEC and the Ontario Ministry for Natural Resources and Forestry for making this comprehensive survey possible and express my gratitude to the biologists, vessel staff, the techs, and all the other uh, folks and faculty at the Lake Ontario Biological Station for welcoming me this fall and introducing me to the waters of New York. Thank you. Three years, I believe.